The following half-hour show is a paid political program and is not endorsed by this station, management, or staff. The following program is sponsored by Excalibur Insurance Management Services. Today's guest's timing could not be better, as the historic debt ceiling bill was just signed in the nick of time by President, President Joe Biden. Our very own United States Congressman Matt Cartwright, who represents Pennsylvania's 8th Congressional District, was in the thick of negotiations to get that bill done, hence the importance of his visit to today's show. You'll remember that Matt was sworn in, believe it or not, 10 years ago to his first term and was more recently just re-elected, November 8, 2022, to his sixth term. In Congress, Matt's prior priorities have been to strengthen the middle class, create jobs, to ensure quality health care, protect seniors, and support veterans and military families. Matt has introduced over 60 pieces of legislation and more bipartisan bills than any other House Democrat. You'll remember that Matt serves on the powerful, as chairman of the powerful House Appropriations Committee. He is on the Appropriations Subcommittees for Commerce, Justice, and Science. He also serves on the Committees for Financial Services and General Government and Military Construction, as well as Veteran Affairs. He is also a member of the House Natural Resources Committee. Matt is also one of the co-chairs of the House Democratic Policy and Communications Committee. Matt graduated magna cum laude with a history degree from Hamilton College, going on to earn his Juris Doctorate from the University of Pennsylvania Law School, where he sat on the Law Review, which is a coveted position. On today's show, we will discuss the impasse between Democrats and Republicans on the legislative bill that was required to raise America's debt ceiling to avoid a catastrophic default which would have affected our economy as well as economies throughout the world. We will also get an update on the very real possibility of railway service to New York City. We look forward to talking to Matt today and getting enlightened on the Democratic view of how that bill got passed. This is the Volpe Report, a weekly news and political interview show examining the latest local, state, and national issues with Chuck Volpe. Insightful, informative, controversial, the area's premier political talk show, The Volpe Report. Congressman, welcome to The Volpe Report. Always good to be with you, Chuck. Well, it's a pleasure, and I, and I have to say, even though we commented off air, but I, I, I think our viewer, you're having to drive to this interview from Washington this morning. The effort it took, uh, on a personal level, thank you. I know that you are one of the rare uh, human beings that have your aviator's license and pilot's license, and you have a plane that you fly back and forth. But to navigate Washington in the Beltway traffic, uh, I, I don't even want to think about it. I usually drive 100 miles out of the way to avoid it, and I still get to my destination quicker. So thank you on a personal note for being here. Uh, well, you're, you're welcome. It's a, a crazy time. I mean, we have all these Canadian forest fa fires, like 150 fires in Quebec alone. Right. And, uh, and down in Washington, uh, holy smoke, you, you couldn't see uh, a mile and a half. And so there's no flying small planes. Right. Uh, and, um, uh, and, 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 of course, what's going on in the Capitol, you know, in the U.S. House is that's uh, it's quite remarkable as well. There's forest fires raging there. <laughs> and just when uh, we thought in a way that, uh, okay, our president signed, averted a crisis, and signed the debt ceiling bill. And I, my immediate reaction, I'll confess with you, since both sides appear genuinely angry at what was the outcome of the bill, just without knowing all the specifics, and that's one of the reasons you're here today, from a taxpayer standpoint, I, when I turned to my wife, said it must be a great bill for the American people since both sides are pissed off at each other. And if every, each side didn't quite get everything they wanted and are angry about some of it, that means it probably was the best form of compromise. And with that uh, not too subtle segue into some of the provisions, as you know, uh, we are fortunate to have our speaker of the House of Representatives. We'll do the last show of my season. Kevin McCarthy will be on this show next week obviously talk about the Republican perspective. So it's great that you're here to talk about the Democratic perspective. So Matt, what did you get accomplished and did you have to have that you got? What things are you not so happy about that, that were let go? So you take it from there. Well, first off, I would say uh, uh, compromise is the spirit 
of, of the Constitution. The, the Constitution lays out the way American government works, and it, it puts checks and balances in place. You know, we have the, the three branches of government. We have, the, we have the, uh, certainly the House and Senate. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a setup that just encourages full debate and compromise at the end if you're going to govern. Uh, and, and that's what happened uh, with this debt ceiling crisis. I must tell you, uh, I think the debt ceiling is an artificial item. That's not in the Constitution. Uh, that was a that was a bill that was enacted uh, a couple of generations ago, and uh, it really it has only been a, a, a tool uh, to uh, try to extract concessions from wh whoever's uh, in power. Uh, and uh, I, I don't like it. I actually, uh, from a legal perspective, I think it's a violation of the Fourteenth Amendment. The Fourteenth Amendment says. You know, the, uh, the national debt of the United States shall not be questioned. Now, you know, and, and uh, everything in the Constitution has to be given meaning. And what possible other meaning could there be from that phrase than that we have to pay our bills when they come due? Of course. Uh, and I've always taken that position that we have to pay our bills. If we want to argue about this or that, you know, uh, how much we're spending, how much, who, what we're spending it on, how much we're taxing, who we're taxing, and how much... All of those are fair game. That's 95% of what they fight about in Washington all the time. Anyway, you don't need to throw in this. You, uh, as a, you, you don't need to tie the American economy to the tracks when the train's coming down. down the world, correction, the world economy, effectively, right? Right. Because our impact will affect all economies. So you have what you have is you're right. There are people pretty angry about that that compromise, and they are the extremists in Congress. I am not one of them. Um, uh, there are extremists on both sides of, of the aisle, uh, and I had people uh, urging me to vote no on the deal. A and I said, uh, under no circumstances am I voting no on that, because I if we default on the national debt, that means the American full faith and credit is no longer good in the world. And that means you know, uh, the one rock solid foundation of the world economy is that America pays its bills and the American dollar can be trusted. And it makes the American dollar the world's currency. Uh, and it, and it, it, it adds to our prestige in the, in the world that, that we have that. It also uh, shores up the world economy, as you mentioned. If we, if we had defaulted on the American debt, interest rates would go up immediately. They, you know, they could have gone up 5% or more. Why? Because we all know interest rates have to reflect the risk of non-repayment of a loan. Of course. That's why if, you're, if you have a bad credit score, you pay higher interest rates to get a loan. Higher risk. Higher risk. And so for no reason other than that there was a political stunt pulled off in Washington, we would have defaulted on the national debt. Interest rates would, would have gone up. You know economic activity stalls when interest rates go up. They have now. And, and as a result, the American economy would go into a deep recession, if not a depression, and the world economy would do the same thing. There is, there is no pri political priority that is worth that. Right. If you, sure, we have, there are Democratic priorities, there are Republican priorities, but before you can have any of these priorities come true, you have to have an American economy to pay for everything. The Republican version is effectively this, Matt, and I really would like your take on it that we know we have to pay our bills and we fully intend. We understand they're the, the party in power in the sense they have the presidency, the initiative. Until recently, uh, like last year, they had both, house, well, both houses of Congress as well as the presidency so that um, we know we have to pay our debt legally and we morally have that obligation. Having said that, that what we're asking in return is we agree all past spending has to be proved. And even though we were against a lot of it, we have to prove it. But the point was, we're talking about the future. And the specific point was the president has come up with a budget proposal somewhere in the 12 to 15 percent increase in discretionary spending. We think that needs to be curbed back because the argument becomes, if we get in this, well, we raise the debt ceiling, we agree on past debts, we owe it. But if we start to keep going in pell-mell, increasing and increasing and create more debt, we come right back in another year or two, we have to keep raising it and raising it and raising it and raising it. 
And they made a fair for a point in the sense of, you know, when does it stop? When do we at some point say we have to cut our spending? So the Republican argument would be effectively, and they made it on the show, and that's why I wanted to give you the benefit of responding, was that we don't question past debt, debts, but we have to use the leverage we have to get some concessions to keep the spending and cap it to a degree going forward. That's their argument. Well, sure. And these are the things that Democrats and Republicans argue over and over and over. Uh, and and uh, if you think about it, the last time we balanced the budget, I mean, it would be nice to balance the federal budget. It's not absolutely necessary. A national debt is OK. Right. You can't do it with your your home finances, but you can do it with a country's finances. And we understand that. Now, economists go along with that. And uh, that's been kind of the norm for for many, many generations in this country. But. The, uh, the point is, you'd like to balance the budget when, you, when and where you can. And the last time it happened was when Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich got together, <laughs> and, and, and they fought tooth and nail. They, I, don't, I didn't think they genuinely disliked each other. Yes, and, I think that's a fair uh, characterization. But they got it done, and they got it done, number one, uh, in a way that w didn't depend on, uh, you know, the train coming down the tracks and, uh, you know, about to run over sweet poly purebred. <laughs> and and uh, and number two, they did it in a balanced way, Chuck. It's not just about cutting spending. It's also about reasonable, responsible revenue gathering. Okay. And so they did it uh, in a balanced approach. They closed a lot of tax loopholes um, to increase revenue coming in. And they and they brought spending down uh, correspondingly. I, I think that's the sensible approach. And what you what you you know you mentioned a couple of Republican politicians, and all they ever talk about is cutting spending. Right. Um, they never talk about closing loopholes, and and I think uh, that ought to be included. Let's talk now, uh, Matt, about some of the specific issues that you were happy your fight and brinksmanship, uh, not only you as a, as, a, as a leader in Congress, but by the president. What things you had to have that you got in the bill? Well, one one thing that, uh, as a, a senior member of the Appropriations Committee, I'm I'm very focused on uh, n not only how much money is spent, but where is spent, and and uh, I worked really hard to get on the Commerce, Justice, and Science Subcommittee of Appropriations, and I got on that in my second term in, in Congress, and so what you uh, on the Democratic side, you gather seniority within the subcommittee. Uh, I stayed there. You don't want to move. You want to gather sub, uh, gather seniority within the subcommittee. And I stayed on that subcommittee till I rose to the top, uh, and I became the chairman of it. Uh, one of the twelve cardinals Wonderful. of the Congress, right? Uh, last Congress, and uh, uh, one of the reasons that I, I was interested in that is that Commerce, Justice, and Science it funds the Department of Commerce, which we're both interested in that. Uh, it funds. Uh, it funds the sciences, uh, in, uh, including the National Science Foundation uh, and the entire space program, which is interesting. Uh, I support that fully. It's there to inspire young people to go into STEM and come up with great innovations and scientific breakthroughs. But it also includes funding the Department of Justice, which includes the FBI, uh, the Federal Bureau of Prisons. We have a federal prison up in uh, Canaan and in, in Wayne County that I've been very involved with, uh, with uh, helping them. Um, but it also includes grants for local uh, law enforcement, local police forces, you know, police forces that are strapped for cash, um, and also uh, district attorney's offices. It is a key function of the, the U.S. Department of Justice that they provide uh, funding uh, for both both of those agencies, police forces and district attorney's office, uh, not only to investigate crime and catch bad guys, but also to prosecute them. Um, and uh, in that budget, in the in the Justice Department budget, which I set as chairman for the last two years, uh, we were able to, to plus up. Uh, the amount of money going to both the police departments and the district attorney's offices. So important because, you know, you're going to have, you've seen it, there's a lot of small towns that have their own police forces. Sure. Um, in and, this region, you're in your district. Exactly. 
Uh, and I, I do like regionalization of police forces because it allows for specialization. If you've got a four-man or four-person police force, you don't, you know, nobody can really specialize. They're all generalists. Um, but, uh, but more than that, uh, they are they are strapped for cash. And, and they, you know, wherever you live, you want to be safe. I consider it the first duty of a member of Congress to stand up for the safety and security of the citizenry. Right. Um, and we have to have, you know, you if you can't sleep at night in your home for fear you're going to be uh, broken in on or, or, or robbed or, or, or hurt in some fashion, if you can't sleep at night, you can't dream. Right. And... and uh, and so that's that's the number one priority is to t is to protect the safety of American citizens. And I take that seriously. And that's why I wanted to get to the top of the Appropriations Committee that funds the Justice Department. Because of that, I've been able to bring home money for our police forces uh, and, and for our district attorney's offices. In fact, um, I won't take you through the whole list, but just in the last couple of years, uh, we've got uh, the uh, Wilkes-Barre City Police, millions of dollars. I'm aware. The, the, the Scranton City Police, millions of dollars. We got, uh, just this year, we got uh, the uh, Luzerne County District Attorney's Office, uh, more than $2 million uh, for, uh, for a special response team. And, and the, it's interesting because the, uh, the Luzerne County DA's office came up with the idea because of those small police forces that I told you about. We have small police forces in Luzerne County that they're they're running around in Crown Vicks that are 20, 24 years old. And have the budget. They don't have the they're, they're so strapped for cash. And the last thing you want to do is have them have to raise taxes on the local homeowners. No, you want to, what I want to do is get money from Washington to su 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 supplement the budgets uh, and that's what the Luzerne County DA's office has done is come in with a task force that's going to be able to supplement the investigatory skills uh, and abilities of local towns and, and, and small police forces. They've been able to do that up in Lackawanna County. Uh, the DA's office, we got, the, we got them a couple of million dollars for anti-gang investigation. They're coming to northeastern Pennsylvania, there's no question. You can't you, you can't put your head in the sand. I mean, if it's happening, if it's real, you have to address it. You have to meet that challenge. Uh, you have to uh, investigate uh, gang activity. You, you need to get to the bottom of it, and you need to prosecute it, and they need the tools to do it. Chuck, all of those things cost money, and rather than raise taxes for the folks here at home, the best way that I figure to get get at it is to get that money from Washington, make sure we get every penny of our fair share of federal tax dollars at work in our area and in a way that's going to keep our citizens safe. Agreed. Uh, it, it's gratifying to hear you say that, I know, and I know you mean it, and you've done more than mean it and talk about it. You're actually bringing back money to fund it, which is so important. I think in, in fairness, you know, in this show, my audience knows because they listen to me every week, uh, you know, a part of the problem have been very progressive Democratic district attorneys. Uh, they have been in certain cases recalled actually by voters. Uh, they have some of them have lost in elections. Uh, but 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 better trend for the Democratic Party is that there there many of them that are there are starting to pivot and understanding that. America cares about crime. It's a number one top issue in that. And 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 look, you were right in the beginning because you said so on this show years ago when the defund the police movement came out in 2020. You were against it. You were not for defunding the police. We had to support our police. So you've been very aggressive and uh, uh, in, in, in forthcoming on that. But that's why what you're doing by Democrats, Democrats fully understand. And again, I was one for 45 years. They need to take a strong position on crime or they're going to lose elections. Well, let me say this. On behalf of the Democratic Party, we're willing to welcome you back, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 thank you for that. And, uh, y y you know, I'm not that far away. I, I find myself I'm a conservative, but but I a responsible conservative. I I'll say I'll say as a mentor, uh, uh, a guy like George Will, for example, who is responding. He's actually a libertarian, you know, not quite purely conservative, but nonetheless, 
yeah, that, that's been my philosophy. And as you and I have talked, and as, since I share political uh, ideas and values with you as a good friend, you know, and you've seen the metamorphosis coming in me. If I felt, as I said to you, that I could make a difference enough in the Democratic Party to change and get them to move back, uh, I would have stayed one. Uh, I did not see in Pennsylvania that opportunity. I thought I could be more effective uh, as a Republican. It's it's actually worked out that way. So so I'm doing my part. You're doing your part. We hope to meet in the middle. And I'm just saying there is redemption. <laughs> Absolutely. But uh, on your larger point about police and some DAs and their attitudes, um, what you're talking about is um, big city problems. Oh, a hundred percent. Right. And Agreed. Uh, you and I are guys that we we had a, we had a choice to live in big cities, and and we came back here to northeastern Pennsylvania. Oh. And that's part of the reason why you and I did that, because Agreed. we don't want any part of big city problems. Nice places to visit. <laughs> New York City, love it, and Philly, of course. And you'll find that even on both sides of the aisle, in northeastern Pennsylvania, we don't have big city politics either. We have we have Democrats who get along with Republicans and vice versa, and, and uh, people that want to get the job done, and uh, practical, pragmatic... Uh, Problem solvers is that is what we have, and those are the politicians that I admired living around here the majority of my adult life, and and that's the kind of thing that made me want to get into politics. One of the things, not to turn this completely to political conversation, uh, but but again, my audience knows and hears me talk about it. I support Democrats and Republicans. Uh, you know, for example, in Lackawanna County, uh, Matt McGloin, who just won a nomination for Democratic County Commissioner. Uh, I mean, he grew up in my house. He's one of my children's best friend. I coached him in basketball and football for about five or six years. But you're years. taking credit for his football success now. No, I, I, I will take credit for I was the first one that moved him from tailback and said, this kid has to be a quarterback at the Westside Falcons. <laughs> and that was when he, I think he was 10 or 11 years old. This kid's throwing 30 and 40 yard spirals as an 11 year old uh, on the sidelines. Yeah. So that's a, a joke between Matt and I. But in, in Billy Gone, I have supported uh, from the time he was a Scranton councilman, president of council and now commissioner. And Chris Shermack, by the same token, I've been a, a, a major supporter of Chris four years ago when he ran. And local politicians, Democrats and Republicans, not the ones at the national or even at the state level, get along great. They, they understand. They, they move it forward. They push the, the, the ball down, down the field, so to speak, because they're more directly responsible and live with the people they represent. Yeah, I tell you, um, I, since you're going to have uh, Speaker McCarthy on your show, um, uh, you know, I, I have to say I've been uh, watching what he's been going through. Uh, you know, we just spent a week in Washington where we were supposed to be voting on bills and uh, debating them and, and uh, amendments and things like that. Nothing happened because uh, a splinter group, uh, uh, the right wingers, actually it was 11 of them, refused to pass before every substantive bill comes up for a vote in the House, there's uh, there are procedural votes called rules. Right. So you have to vote on the rule, and you have to pass the rule before you can bring up the substantive bill for a vote. Um, now it's traditional that the part the the majority that brings up you know the speaker brings up the bill, and 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 the the speaker's party votes in favor of the rule, even if they might vote against the bill. They vote in favor of the rule so that the bill can come up for a vote. That's kind of a mouthful, but that's the way it works in in Washington. Well, uh, this week, the splinter group of of Republicans who were mad about the uh, M McCarthy's uh, compromise on the debt ceiling, they refused to vote for the the first rule that came up, uh, and so that. So the, the, the rule failed and the bill couldn't be brought. It was something about gas stoves was kind of non-consequential. But uh, and we knew it wasn't about gas stoves that they were fighting about. It was about that debt ceiling compromise. And 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 that's the first time a rule has failed in the United States House of Representatives since 2002. Wow. It's and, amazing. You know, it's funny you mentioned that. You know, as yourself, I'm a voracious reader. And I specifically, one thing when you said that stuck out, and that was, I remember reading, I can't give you the, the book, but it was, uh, it was on John F. Kennedy. And he, I remember him specifically in that book talking about 
that one of his most important legislative victories in the first 100 days that he took office, they won a hotly contested uh, deciding to majority and chairmanship of the House Rules Committee. Right. And his specific quote was, now at least my legislation has a chance to get to the floor for a vote and get out of a committee because that person ensured that, that he'd be able to get his bills heard. So your point is well taken. Even the powerful president of the United States can't get bills introduced if the rules committee is such a, in such a state that you can't get rules passed. Well, I'll be interested. I'll be watching your show uh, with uh, Speaker McCarthy because he's in a very dicey position. Uh, uh, it, again, it's it's been a generation since this has happened that a Speaker of the House has been rendered uh, powerless uh, to bring up ordinary bills for votes. And, and what I'm worried about is that um, we have to pass appropriations bills. And if they can't come up for a vote, uh, uh, ordinary business, you know, the, the, the blocking and tackling of getting government done in Washington may grind to a halt. Wow. Yeah, uh, we live in strange times, Matt. Uh, you're right. I'm lucky to have him. And, and, and I will say, obviously, uh, presaging that interview, which is a week from now, that, you know, I had thought initially my first reaction when the bill was done was that this was a great victory for him because because of how he came into the speakership, almost historic 15 votes it took to get become speaker. The narrative has been for a long time and it's been on this show for months. You know, is he effectively the leader of the party? Or is there going to be a recall on his speakership? Will they call for basically like they do in Parliament and attempt to remove him from speaker? So I thought this was a victory where he had gotten control of the reins of power in his own party, and now this happens. There are a lot, it's, uh, ask him about this because there are a lot of hard feelings in the Republican conference right now. You have uh, the, the real uh, right-wingers that are in open revolt right now, but then you have about 150 kind of regular down-to-business Republicans that uh, that are really angry that uh, uh, they're they're powerless to move anything in government right now. I'll give you an example. I said, uh, I, in addition to the Commerce, Justice, and Science subcommittee, I, I'm also the number two Democrat on the Financial Services and General Government subcommittee of appropriations. And my chairman of that uh, is Steve Womack, from, um, uh, a Republican from Arkansas, uh, and uh, he's very much a get it done, pragmatic kind of a, a Republican congressman, and uh, he has every interest in moving his appropriations bill through the through the House, uh, you should see, it, it just about burns your eyes to see the things that he's saying in print about those right-wingers uh, gumming up the works of government right now. Wow. Well, that will be uh, something that uh, we will talk about next week. And it's hard for me to say that we have just blown through a half-hour show, Matt, believe it or not. Uh, but again, thank you so much for being here. And, and I always get an education every time you're sitting across from me. I found out things that will help me in my next week's interview from you because I don't have that inside view. I, you know, I read the New York Times every day and they don't get the inside view of what happens really in the back rooms of the halls of Congress. So thanks, my friend. Always a pleasure. We're going to get you back in the boat, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> You've been the one person that has been persistent. If Look, if anybody could do it, it will be you. Again, we're here today with uh, our very own United States Congressman, Matt Cartwright, who is now in his sixth term. You've heard me say uh, uh, how we have benefited as he has become one of the quickest paths to chairmanship of the powerful House Appropriations Committee did so in the majority for a number of terms. He's brought back countless tens of millions of dollars to the area. And uh, you've heard now his emphasis is on funding police and the pro providing funding for district attorney's offices and the importance of law enforcement. So we're thankful for the update. I am now better prepared to talk to the speaker next week based on his inside information that you don't get in the local newspaper. So uh, thank you again, Matt. And we'll be back next week with Speaker Kevin McCarthy, the United States House of Representatives. <laughs>